Hello friends. Thank you for joining me today. My name's Dan. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> and this is Daily Art Adventure number 569. Starting a large skyline painting on on uh, March 15th. A day that will live in infamy <laughs> if you happen to be the proud owner of a corporation in the United States of America. This is, this is income tax day. I learned recently, was it 40%? I can't remember, 55%, 40% of them 45% of the people in America pay 100% of the taxes. I'm one of the taxpayers. That means, I for, and I forget, you can Google this. Uh, you know that top 1% that, that uh, those of a Marxist persuasion, even they don't know it's Marx, Marx the top 1%, that those people that we are encouraged to hate, pay 99% of the taxes in America. Oh, that works real well. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> it is good to be back. Whew, I am back out in my garage. As you can see, starting a new painting. Woohoo! Hey, come on, let's get, let's get my... There we go. Got my monitor going here so I can see you guys chatting with me. All right, so this is roughly six and a half by seven and a half feet it's going to be a painting of the skyline of raleigh let me show you the image i'm going by there's a photograph that i have very carefully cropped uh, to be the same ratio as this and then yes because of the specificity that is to say there's a lot of things in here i really have to get specifically in the right place uh and in the interest of getting this job done in a expeditious manner i've not gone got time to waste i did indeed do a grid so i'll be i'll talk about that more but so in in photoshop on my computer i don't know if you can even see the little tiny grid lines here uh, and then um, on this canvas with tape measure and big straight edges, I drew a grid, corresponding grid, in red um, watercolor pencil. That's what I'm looking for, watercolor pencil. Um, it's not coming off as easily as I would thought that my, my gesso here has a lot of tooth. Do you hear that? <laughs> That's tooth. Uh, so the I, I'm having a harder time getting the the watercolor pencil washed off, which is part of the reason I use watercolor pencil because you, you can you can rub it off. Um, let me show you uh, uh, how that works. So all the way up here, let's take a little a sample. So I have two tools for doing this. One is a a wet brush and one is a a wet rag. So you just rub and rub and rub and rub. And you can just keep rubbing with a brush and eventually it'll come off. But of course, it, as you see there, it's left quite the pink halo. So I find it beneficial to rub also with a rag, which is slightly dirty because I've been using it on all the rest of the, this canvas. And so it's leaving, again, a pinkish gray uh, tint on the canvas, which is not particularly pleasant. Okay, which, do I want to launch into this already? I guess I do. So let me zoom back out. Do I want to launch into what you ask? <laughs> Well, do, do I want to get philosophical 
already. <laughs> um, not sure that I do. Hang on just a second. Let me let me go ahead and. So, besides putting a, a grid on my painting in Photoshop, I also took some masking, some duck, some uh, frog tape, masking tape, and and uh, I'm able to isolate one square at a time. I'm finding it helpful because I can't see the lines quite well enough. So this just helps me to 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 get the in, inside of each square fairly accurate. Does that make sense? All right, so let's let's zoom in here. Oh, by the way, that's a a bicycle handlebar that you see in your way there. I my wife and I hang our bikes from the ceiling of the garage. And uh, I'm sorry that that's in your way there, but it'll do. Okay, I'm not, not this is not philosophical. This is practical. This plain plain old practical stuff. Here it is. Uh, as you know. It is very atypical of me to uh, do a grid, except when I'm doing wedding portraits. Then I often do grids in that in that regard, in that in that context. Uh, but not typical for me to do a grid, and totally, totally not typical for me to. Um, to start out a painting by doing a drawing, right? Are you with me? Very atypical. Now, in a sense, what I'm doing right now is very typical of what I call old-fashioned oil painting. And I say that partly because my dad, who is older than me, <laughs> um, painted in the traditional, you know, middle of the 20th century method, which is you have a little bit of vine charcoal, you start an oil painting by doing a sketch on your canvas, and then you begin to paint. And he was quite good at it. I'll sh I haven't showed you some of his paintings. I need to do that one of these days. It was, uh, of course, it, it was a hobby for him. It was not never his profession. Um, But that was that was the the standard operating procedure for oil painters, perhaps for centuries. I'm not really sure, but years and years and years and years, long, long, long time. That 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 was how that was how you start a painting. You you do a sketch first. Now, by the way, nothing I nothing wrong. Again, nothing wrong with this. It's okay. No doubt there are there are artists out there whose shoes I am not worthy to unlace to use that ancient and revered expression. No doubt there are that are there are to be a little bit more harsh. No doubt there are artists out there who who could wipe the floor with me to so to speak. <laughs> who are way better than I am, who do in fact start their paintings uh, with with charcoal. Well, you know part of me wants to say bully for them. <laughs> um, they they may be good, but in many cases, they would be better than they are. They would be better than themselves if they didn't. Okay, so anyway. Um, here is the danger. Any chats? Hey, John Rope. Yeah, you got, you got it. John nailed me exactly already. So unusual. Here's what's, here's the danger. Hey, Nicholas Bravo. Appreciate your company, man. Appreciate your encouragement. Um, here's the danger. Here's why I don't start with pencil normally. Now, why am I doing it today? Because this is a huge canvas. And <laughs> I don't know if you understand this or not, but the, the, the propensity, if you will, for getting lost is increased. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? A mathematical term. Anyway. Hugely increased. It'll come 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 back to me in a second. Okay, the 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 capacity for messing up is exponentially increases exponentially with the size with a, with a large canvas. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so why am I doing a drawing? Because I've got to get this painting done. 
I'm, I, I, I got to get this drawing done. Okay, so here's why we, I, many of us, why I recommend strongly against starting with a pencil. Now remember, every rule can be broken. The name of my book slash video series that, by the way, took a step closer to coming out uh, is called The Breakable Laws of Painting. If you don't think there are any laws, you've just been corrupted by some, some art teacher who wants to appear s smart um, by uh, playing semantics, okay? Usually goes along the lines of, and I know you regulars, you've heard me say this so many times, forgive me, but it usually goes along the line of this. There's no such thing as laws in painting. You tell me a law and I'll show you a painting that violates it. Something like that, okay? Now, a couple of things you have to know about people that say stuff like that. One, if they in fact are a lousy painter, <laughs> then they're telling you why. Because they don't think there are any laws. That's why they're a lousy painter. That, sad to say, that statement, that description fits many art professors, okay? Um, not all by any means, but way too many, way too many. So they say there aren't any laws. Anyway, um, of course, all, every law can be broken. Again, that's I mean, made clear in the title of my book slash video series, The Breakable Laws of Painting, right? Um, I know I beat that horse to death long, uh, uh, many, not, many enough times. Here, it, it, how do you know when to break a law? That's, that's, that's the next question. So if a laws can be broken, then how do you know when to break them? The answer is when two laws collide, that's when you break one of the laws. When law A contradicts law B in this particular setting, in a particular context, then what do you do? Then you break one of the laws. I would say it's not a law, but this is really, it's kind of like it. I would say never start with a pencil drawing, never. Oh, except when law B comes along, which says huge canvas, highly technical subject matter, you have not got all day, then oh, by all means, do a grid and start with a pencil. Are you with me? So everything's legal. You just have to win. Now, now, here's the part I really want to get to. Here's the part I really want to talk about. Um, I guess I still do need my masking tape. I keep thinking I'm, I'm beyond the point that I need it, but evidently I am not. Okay, here's the part I want to talk about. So, here we are. Here I am today, violating one of my own rules, so to speak. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a strong suggestion. I'll put it that way, okay? Um, then what is, what is wrong with starting with a drawing? Why is that... A, a normal rule. I told you why I'm breaking it today, but why normally is that a rule? Why would someone like me say, no, no, never, every rule can be broken. Why would I say, never start with a pencil drawing? Because, a couple reasons. One is, once you put lines down on your canvas, it's virtually impossible to avoid coloring in the lines. And, and most of you, 99.999% of you, I've met two artists in my life, two, two artists in my whole life, who came out of the chute loose. Everybody else comes out tight, starts out tight, and wants to get loose. I've met two artists out of thousands. Okay, so I don't know what the percentage are. 99.99% of artists are like me. They're tight and they want to get loose. And uh, if that's you, then, then by all, please don't ever start with a pencil drawing, because as soon as you put lines on your draw, draw or ish lines, drawing lines on your canvas, it's virtually impossible, especially for you. I'm being kind of mean here, because because I'm going to show you how I avoid that in just a minute. But um, most most of you, um, in particular, will have a very hard time. After you put lines down, you're, you're going to be, even though you feel like you're being loose, you know, I, I, I see this <laughs> all the time among students, you know. Well, because I'll walk up to their canvas and say, you know, and I say, well, you're getting a little tight. And they go, yeah. <laughs> and then I say, D -d -d do you want me to fix that? And they say, yeah. 
So I take a brush and I go, I make a mess on their canvas. They go, oh, because <laughs> they think I'm, it looks like I'm destroying their painting, right? But the, after they come back to their senses, put their eyeballs back in their head, they go, oh, you made it better. <laughs> of course I did. So anyway, the difference between me and most of my students is I have more courage, but you can have courage just by watching me. You know, for instance, like uh, I think, I think I'm a, I'm a fairly free painter. I think I'm a fairly loose painter until when? Till I see somebody looser. And I can name three. I, I named these, these are three of my, you know, go-to muses right now. Jeremy Mann, Richard Schmid, and Tibor Nagy. Spelled just the way it sounds. He's from Eastern Europe somewhere. There you go. So I think I'm loose. I'll, I'll go back to Jeremy Mann, young man out in San Francisco, disgustingly young man <laughs> in his 40s. Uh, I think I'm loose to look at him and go, whoa. So looking at his looseness gives me courage. All right. So likewise, let my looseness bring you courage. Not the looseness I'm doing right now because this is not loose. But I'm, I'm about to show you in, in just a little while uh, what to do about that. Is that making sense? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to overcome Okay, there's a pretty much a straight line. There's a hang on here. I have to think really carefully for a minute. All right, from there to there. So I'm going to take a break here. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to broadcast all day. I'm, I mean, I'll be painting much of the day, and I, I, I can't afford to uh, just be, be be broadcasting the entire time. You know, I don't want a six-hour broadcast, right? Scintillating though I may be. <laughs> Um, <laughs> scintillating though I may be, I, I, I can't afford to bore you guys absolutely to tears, um, so I won't. Um, but I will tell you a, a couple of things. Well, I'll come back and broadcast this later. There, there are a couple of things that are happening on this canvas right now. Uh, that I'm gonna to have to work with. First of all, you can see that where I wipe off the red, my brush or my rag gets into the black and the black is smearing and turning gray. Let me zoom in real tight so you can see some where this has happened. Some of you would be sending me texts or comments or emails saying, I used those pencils and they just smeared. They were awful. They made black and gray marks all over my canvas. Sorry for mocking your voice there, but <laughs> okay. Not that you would do that, but you know, somebody else watching might do something like that. I'm, I'm deciding which way to go and how, how deep to get into this. Okay, I'll, I'll, get, I'll, I'll keep going. <laughs> I'll keep going while I keep drawing. Okay, so if you will, I have a problem on my hands. I have a problem on my hands. I have what most would consider ugly gray smudges appearing across my canvas. Now, I will, I'll go ahead and tell you that even the gray smudges aren't pure accident. Once I saw that the gray smudging was happening, that, did you catch it? Once I saw that it was happening, I began to play with it. I began to move it. I began to make the essence of good painting is making interesting marks at every single layer of the painting process. In fact, quick detour. I'll get to back to the gray smudges in a minute, but quick detour. So here I am drawing. What's the, what's the I'm drawing with a pencil and you see how I'm holding it. Um, what is, you tell me class, what is the essence of good drawing? What's the essence of good drawing? Exactly. Same as good painting, making interesting, Interesting is the word I'm saying. Making interesting marks. That is the essence of good painting is making interesting marks. So even with this pencil, that, that's huge, by the way. So here I am drawing, which is boo for drawing, right? Boo for drawing first on your canvas. But one, ways, one of the ways to mitigate against the boo-ness <laughs> of that is make sure that your marks are interesting, which is not unrelated to the way I'm holding my pencil. 
Oh boy, I have so many detours in me. Okay, I'm going to take another detour, and then I'm going to come back to the gray smudges. Um, yesterday or the day before, I was watching very happily uh, one of my favorite um, artists. He's quite famous. I've mentioned him before. I won't mention him right now, so I'm about to criticize him. I, I was watching, and, and my wife was watching over my shoulder. And I said, to you, I said, do you see how he's holding his pencil? I have listeners periodically, because as you know, I advocate against this. And I advocate holding, this one's so short. I advocate holding a pencil side saddle, in, unless you're doing the detail stuff, okay? And here was this, we were watching this video, enjoying it, benefiting, I benefiting very much from watching this very famous and very excellent artist working and um, he was not holding his pencil in the Dan Nelson approved prescribed manner. You with me? And so I could hear people coming back through my comments and through, through my chat saying, you know, well, you don't have, to. I had an art teacher one time who didn't ever hold his pencil that way and he was a fantastic drawer. I, I, I'm not, not being defensive, but again, I'm, I'm passionate to make the whole world better artists. So. Here's, here, I, here's my answer to that. This person who is uber famous, rich probably, very talented. When he's drawing, he holds his pencil this way. What is happening is most people don't have the visual acuity discernment to look at his drawing and say, what I would say, forgive me that, I know it sounds like I'm claiming to have that. Well. I do. <laughs> Most people don't have the visual acuity to look at his drawing and say, you know what, this guy is a fantastic painter. But, and it's okay, because it was just an underdrawing. He covered it all up with paint. But his drawings, per se, are not that good. And that's true. So this friend who, he doesn't know me, but this guy who I like online, who's a master, famous, excellent artist, holding pencil the wrong way, would he himself would be better than he is if he would abandon this script and go to this script. Now, I will say that he was doing a, a drawing this big, so that kind of will cut him some slack. That's, that's so small, he almost have to. But anyway, so yeah, make interesting marks, hold your pencil the right way. Um, mo many people, many of my students, they hear that and then they say, then they try it for seven minutes and they go, it's too uncomfortable. I'm, I, they do it with that tone of voice too, I promise. <laughs> and, and they um, they give up because they think, oh, I tried it once for five minutes and it didn't feel comfortable, so I quit. <laughs> that to my friends is stupid and makes me laugh. Um, no, 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 of course it's uncomfortable because you've never done it that way in your life. Everything you've never done before is uncomfortable until you get used to doing it, right? All right, so bad to start a painting with a drawing. Therefore, one of the things you make sure is that your drawing is nice lines. These are pleasant marks. They are not unpleasant marks. That's huge. Okay, now let's go back to the ugly gray mess that, that began to appear on my canvas uh, as I started wiping off the, the red lines. In the course of wiping off the red lines, I found myself picking up, besides the red not coming off very easily, besides that, um, in addition to that, the, my, my brushes and rags were, were picking up um, ugly gray smudges, okay? Again, that's what I'm, this, this stuff up here is what I'm talking about, okay? Once I saw that happening, I began to play with it and make sure that I, kind of spread, like this stroke right here is an intentional, and this one, an intentional smear right through the gray, smearing on purpose. Okay, here's what I really want to talk about today, and I'll, I, maybe I'll talk about it throughout much of the day, to tell you the truth. <coughs> um, okay, so this painting's only six and a half feet tall, so it's nice, I can raise it up. Uh, which is a nice, nice luxury to have. Um, here's what I really want to talk about today. Uh, 
hang on. What I'm what I'm doing over here is I'm 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 continually repositioning my little bit of masking tape to, to isolate each square. I'm just finding it's easy. Without that, I found it really easy just to get lost in my uh, in my drawing. Um, my music. I don't know if you can hear my music or not. It's a little bit loud in my ear. Um, Gray smudges. Brings me to another subject that I do want to talk about. I'll, I will talk about this, I'm sure, more and more, noticeably more in the m weeks and months to come because it's, it's one of those uh, concepts that is, I'll say it's working on me. That is, it, it's coming up in my conscious mind a lot over and over again in in the last several weeks. So it's one of those things that that I'm supposed to talk about, okay? It has to do with four levels of knowledge, understanding. When I was getting my master's degree, one of the classes I took, not in art, one of the, master, one of the courses I took was uh, uh, principles of teaching. And I expected it to be a boring class, and I was happily surprised. It was a it was a blockbuster, because it was it was broad and philosophical, universal, you know, analyzing the human condition and and how humans think and learn and so on and so forth. So I so I loved it. It was it was fantastic. Um, this is 30, 40 years ago now. Um, one of the principles that uh, we learned in that class. One, in fact, like week number one, introduction to teaching. One of the things that we were taught, I believe rightly so, is that there are four levels or categories of learning and four categories of teaching. That is, if, if you want to be a teacher, you have to have a clear teaching objective that, that kind of language is real common still to, to um, people who are uh, teachers, pedagogists of all kinds. You have teaching obje objective, right? And um, there are four levels of learning or four levels of teaching. Either, 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 either one of those expressions will work. Four levels of learning, four levels of teaching. And they are, I'm going to give you the four, because this, this relates very much to art and the way people learn art. The four levels are knowledge, skill, understanding, and wisdom. Four categories of teaching, four categories of knowledge. Knowledge, understanding, and different order, knowledge, understanding, wisdom and skill and if you're hearing now there's three of those are progressive knowledge is this deep understanding is deeper wisdom is deeper still and parallel to all those are skill you can teach skill but it's a, it's a slightly different category it's sort of like the thumb against the other three skill is over here i'm a three ha three fingered hand okay knowledge wisdom understanding and skill is counter sort of parallel to those um all right let's talk about art so in the world of art there are four levels of learning four levels of understanding four levels of teaching all of those statements are true four levels of teaching four levels of learning four levels of thinking about uh art hang on just saying that is not right the reason I'm doing a grid is to get things right. And here I find myself even, even with the grid still screwing up, so to speak. Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, this relates, by the way, to the gray smudges. <laughs> of course, er these days everything relates to this because it's what I'm thinking about a lot. Um, Knowledge is important. 
Without knowledge, you're without knowledge, ignorant, I, I, without gnosis, gnosis, Greek, without knowledge, you're ignorant. No, nothing wrong with being ignorant, by the way. I hope you understand that. Um, there's most of the subjects in the world I am ignorant about, and I'm quite comfortable with that. <laughs> I only need to be non-ignorant, <laughs> gnosis. I only need to be knowledgeable about some areas of life. Um, knowledge is the shallowest level. You have to have knowledge. Now, if I may, I'm going to correlate that level of understanding in art. I'm going to correlate when students begin, when I began, I, I was just, I, I, you know, I've been an artist since I was five, professional artist since I was 17. Um, uh, but I only started oil painting about 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, I was ignorant. I was without knowledge about oil painting. There's all kinds of things I did wrong because I didn't have knowledge. Um, so level number one is you have to get some knowledge. And most of my students are operating at the in their art, are operating at the knowledge level. Nothing wrong with that. Not, absolutely nothing wrong. You have to start somewhere. Okay, but as you can tell, that this is going somewhere else, so to speak. Um, you start with knowledge, but you want to move on to something else, right? And what do you want to move on to? The answer is you want to move on to wisdom. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. You want to move on to understanding. Sorry, I skipped one there. All right? So, um, and this, this actually could help many of you to a significant degree in your art journey, in your art uh, learning. You start with knowledge, but you need to move on to understanding. Um, I'm going to give you a description of a typical art student, someone who's fairly early in their art journey. I can describe them for, and I'll be describing some of you. But again, there's no shame in being without knowledge. Okay. Um, but a typical art student, here's how you know they're at the knowledge level, is because they went off, say, for instance, and took an art class, especially a three, four, five day art class, especially from a big dog. Not me. I'm a middle-sized dog, <laughs> but they, they, they go and take an art class from a, a big dog, like a, like a Kevin McPherson or, or a, a Nelson Shanks or a, somebody like that. Gotcha? Daniel Green. And, and when they, you, you, you'll recognize this person, whether you've been, whether you are this or whether you've been one or not, you'll recognize this person. And they come home from this big art class and, and what are they? You tell me, what are they? They come, they come home from this big, big art class from this big dog and what are they, what are they full of? <laughs> well, they're full of themselves, but they're full of knowledge. <laughs> so they, think, they say things like, so, not necessarily with this attitude, but they, they will say, well, I took a class from Kevin McPherson and Kevin McPherson says, blank. <laughs> That's someone who's operating on the knowledge level. Knowledge is good, but it's not as good as something better, which is what? Next level down, understanding. So what got me into this, even this mode of thinking here this morning was this mess that started happening on my canvas with the gray. Now, some an artist who is stuck in, in knowledge level would say, well, Dan says we can use black pencils, but when I do it, I get gray and it just doesn't work, so I quit. <laughs> Knowledge breaks down when the person in any field of human endeavor whatsoever, when the person gets what I call off book. <laughs> I had an experience uh, many, many years ago, many, many, many years ago. Um, I was single. 
and I've been married 38 years, so you know, I'm, I'm going back a ways here. Um, I had an experience where I was driving a, an old car. I was a, you know, broke, single student type person, you know, that stage of life. And uh, I was driving an old car and um, the transmission started going bad. So I went into Amco. I, re I still remember. And this was in Fort Worth, Texas. I went into a American Trans Amco Transmission Company. And um, the, the daughter, I believe, of the owner was the person who waited on me. And um, she said, well, you need a new transmission. And, and I, being ignorant of such matters, said, well, and I said, well, why? What's wrong with my transmission? Now she had she worked on the operate she worked operated as many young people do on the on the level of knowledge. She knew what to say. She said what her daddy told her to say, which was you your transmission is completely ruined. You need a new transmission. Are you getting the point? That's the book that I'm talking about. And most customers are supposed to say, okay, and, and I wasn't rude or anything or ornery. I can be that way, but I wasn't. I just said, and she brought out the plates, the steel plates from, from my transmission, said, see, look at these, they're completely ruined. But I was holding in my hand a steel plate. It looked perfectly like a steel plate to me because I didn't know what it was supposed to look like. And at the point, this story's getting too long. Anyway, the point was when I said, well, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? She didn't have understanding, she only had knowledge. She'd never been asked the question by a customer. Here's one of my automatic transmission plates. I'm holding it in my hand. I don't see anything wrong with it. What's wrong with it? And <laughs> it's so funny. This is why it's stuck in my mind. Because at that moment, she was forced to go off book. In other words, in her training, they had never given her that answer. So she said, kind of like this, uh, I, I guarantee you, those are completely ruined. <laughs> and that phrase, I guarantee you, those are completely ruined. <laughs> now, in the, I don't remember if it was right then or, I, or, or sometime later, I came, I, I came to find out what that steel disc was supposed to look like <laughs> in a good transmission. Turns out it's supposed to be rough, and the one in my hand was smooth. Simple, easy answer, but she didn't, that wasn't in her knowledge. It was off book. Now, I'm sure the next week or the next day, her daddy said to her, oh, tell him that it's, see that, that disc is smooth and it's supposed to be rough. Perfect answer. But for her, it was on a different level. It was understanding what was wrong with this, not saying, I guarantee you that is completely ruined. <laughs> You can just burn such a such a an image in my mind that I thought about it for all these years since. The poor girl. I didn't. I didn't really didn't mean to throw her for for a loop. It, it happened accidentally. Um, okay. Why isn't my easel sliding across? There we go. Um, anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> let me get back on on topic here, okay? So an art student goes away and studies, and, and by the way, it is more has, this, this hazard is particular to artists, students, who do go and take from a big dog, like Kevin McPherson, Daniel Green, I, I've taken from both of those guys. Um, why? Because when you take from a big famous person, you're more likely to think they, they are a god and not a man, and you receive their knowledge but you don't really understand why their knowledge applies. Okay. Does that make sense? So, um, and that's no shame. We, we all start there, but there is shame, I suppose I would say, in staying there. We all have to graduate from a knowledge level, and this is, by the way, in every sphere of life, not, of course, not just in, in art or painting. We, have to, we, we need to graduate. I mean, woe be to you if you start trying to parent children based on a knowledge. Well, I read a book and the book said thus and so. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Your child's going to be in counseling when he's 40 because you screwed him up so bad because you went by a book and the book gave you knowledge. 
knowledge peters out where the book peters out, the book, where the book learning. Everybody knows about book learning, right? Every, every farmer, rancher in history of humankind know there's a limit to book learning because there's stuff you experience in the real life that you just can't get from a book. Um, and that's sort of what I'm talking about. So um, here I am, I'm getting gray smudges yesterday afternoon when I started this painting. I'm getting gray smudges up here. And, and uh, if I was stuck in a knowledge level of art, under, uh, 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 art knowledge, art understanding, I would have been stuck. I would have been screwed. Okay. But hallelujah, I am not stuck. I am not stuck in a knowledge level. I operate in an understanding level. Ooh. Now, let me, so I've talked about knowledge level. It's head knowledge. It's facts. It's book learning. And it's good. You have to have knowledge. You do, because you can screw up bad if you don't have knowledge. But it's not the be all. It's only the beginning. You have to move to understanding. Now, I use this expression a lot. Let me, let me use a different description for what I'm talking about here for, for a different description for um, under, the understanding level of, um, by the way, that, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Did you see that streak going in there? I like it. Um, many times when I teach, both online and in person, when I teach, I say to you and I say to my students, because I'm saying it to myself, I'm saying, um, we paint with our, this is a, a mantra of mine, we paint with our eyes. What I'm saying there is we paint at an understanding level, not simply at a knowledge level. So here I am getting gray smudges. If I was operating only on the knowledge level, and I, something sort of bad, ostensibly bad starts happening on my canvas, if I was operating on a knowledge level, I would go, ah, oh my God, Dan said I could use these pencils, but it's creating gray smudges. Must be something wrong with my knowledge. Either he's wrong, or I'm using the wrong kind of pencil, I'm using it the wrong way. Knowledge, 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 knowledge or understanding, we always paint with our eyeballs, always. You never paint by rule, you paint by eye. The rules have grown up after the fact. Rules, the rules of painting are post priori. They're not a priori. That is to say, a bunch of philosophers didn't sit around in, Gre in Greece 2,000 years ago, as an example, and come up with the rules of painting and say, well, there's seven elements of design, line, shape, value, value text, line, shape, uh, color, value, texture, blah, 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 blah. They did not. <laughs> no, 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 no. People started doing art and then they would sit around and analyze, why do we like to look at this? And well, we're not sure why we like it, but look, it has interesting line shape, val line shape value, design, texture, color, okay? So the, the rules came after the good art. Good art does not come from rules. Good art happens. The rules come from good art. There, you, that's a good way to put it. Post priori, the rules are after the fact. The fact is, beautiful artwork happens. Then the rules are, tr are a way to try to explain why this is good. Now, the rules can help us, of course. Um, as you know, breakable laws, breakable rules of painting. Um, but you never paint by the rules. You know them, you learn them. If you don't know them, you're just ignorant. As I, as I, you know, I also say all the time, if you don't think there are any rules, you're probably just screwing up. That is tragically true. If you don't think there are any rules, I'm sorry, that's why your paintings are ugly. Ugly is even worse than ugly, okay? Ugly is like really ugly. <laughs> um, but you don't want to paint by rules. You want to paint with your eyes. So that's just another way of saying we, we paint at an understanding level, not a knowledge level. Boy, that took me a long time to get around there. Let me give you another example of what it means to paint by eye instead of by knowledge or rules. You don't paint by knowledge. You learn, but then you move to understanding. I have a client right now who wants me to come and make modifications to her paint commission painting. Not a terrible surprise because 
I've seen this coming, but this is classic. This is classic. In this painting, which is my painting, and it's good. It's a good painting. One of my. It's a home run. Uh, there are four objects at somewhere in the painting. I don't, I'm not going to tell you what they are because I don't want you to know who it is or anything like. But in the painting, there are four discrete or distinct things. Now, I mean, there's a thousand things in the painting. You understand? But in one area, there's an, a set of four. There you go. There's a set of four objects. And my client went to a class and learned in an in an adjunct in a nearby category, not in art, but in a nearby. In a designerly class, she learned that odd numbers are better than even. Book learning, knowledge. So she's come back to me and said, um, I know that odd numbers are better than even, so would you mind adding one more? <laughs> now, I am going to make some other little changes that they've requested to their painting. Um, yeah, of course, partly to make him happy. But when it comes to that one, um, I am going to have to be very discreet and very politic and very gentle and very, very gently. I need to say to this person, you're an idiot. <laughs> very gently. I need, I won't say anything like that, of course, but I need to say, oh, that is so stupid. That is so stupid. I cannot describe to you how utterly ignorant that is. You are right. Odds are, I know this rule. I wrote the book. <laughs> Not the only book, but you understand. <laughs> I wrote the book <laughs> about the laws of painting. Yes, odds are better than evens. But what? But what? Unless there's a clash of rules, which in this context, in this space, four was the right number. Five would be a disaster. Okay, that's a classic example of painting by knowledge. You need to get beyond painting. So let me go back to the gray smudges. How does, this, how does that apply to gray smudges? Quite, quite simple. If you're operating by knowledge, you're saying, oh my, oh my goodness, I've got gray smudges. If you're operating by understanding, you're painting by eye. That means, first of all, you make the smudges interesting. And then you fought, but the main thing is I'm going to follow up with stuff. I'm going to follow up with steps and stages. And then you might say, if like, if you, if you've seen my, you know, set of 15 steps of painting, which is, you can see on, on YouTube, uh, on my community, go to Dan Nelson, hit my, hit my channel button. And there's home playlist videos, community, click on community and scroll down a couple weeks back and you'll see my list of 15. So if I, if I go in here then and start doing something about my gray smudges, you're going to go, but that's not on your list. <laughs> see, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. You've heard that. That's, that's related to this. Um, people who are stuck, who all they have is knowledge, they, they, they can't be good at anything until they get down to the understanding level. So of course I'm going to go, so to speak, off book. Of course I'm going to start, I'm going to do some things that are not um, in my list because I've got a different situation. There you go, so there's a summary statement. Why am I going to abandon Dan Nelson's very carefully thought out, worked out, hammered out through the hard knocks of life, my, at the moment, 15 stages of painting? By the way, it could change next month. Of course, you know that. Why? Because I don't operate based on knowledge. I operate based on understanding. The list of 15 comes from an understanding, not from a rule keeping. But, but students latch onto what their master teacher said, said, and they make it sacred. They make it scripture. They make it the law. And they say, no, well, you know, Daniel, Daniel, um, what's his name? Portrait guy, Nelson Shanks. And, um, you know, Nelson Shanks says, oh, yeah, you have to do it this way. They don't know that Nelson Shanks breaks his own rules. I, I know he does because he's brilliant and all brilliant people do the same thing. They don't follow their own rules. They just, their rules are, are an encapsulation of what they've learned at an understanding level to help people are still at the knowledge level. Masters work at understanding level. But in order to teach beginners, they have to take understanding and put it in that ABC one, two, three level. All right, I ranted and raved way longer than I expected to. Um, 
I'm going to take a little break here and be back to show you. So what am I going to do next? And this will be fun. By the way, I really, I really like this painting already. <laughs> I just, I like the way it feels. I've done this scene, uh, this landscape, this skyline of Raleigh probably a dozen times, but never at this size. And I really like the way this road feels down here. Whoa, it just brings the viewer right in. That's, that's fun. Those, those shapes right there. All right, little break. Uh, let me look at your chats. Oh my goodness, there's a whole bunch of chats. Whoa, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Let's go back and see what you guys are saying. Appreciate it. I already commented on a couple of them. Uh, do the pencils thinker 888. Good to hear from you. Do the pencils you use bleed into the oil paint less? Yes, good. They do. They do bleed, but not as much in the oil. Part of the reason I like these pencils and I talk about, I describe them to you all the time. Jerry's Autorama. Um... Jumbo Jet Black. Um, the reason I use them is because they play well with both water and oil, but they don't bleed quite as much in the oil stage. You're right. Hi, Terry Somerville. Good to hear from you. New, new viewer, new name that I don't recognize. Good to have you on board. Paul, looks like an expensive canvas. Well, you stretch it yourself, of course. Um, maybe at some point I'll show you the back. Um, it's made out of lumber. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> made out of lumber, bought at, you know, Lowe's, Home Depot, not at an art store. It's not, it's not built on, it's way too big for the commercial stretcher bars. Uh, it's built with a chop saw and so on and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and Lope said, to avoid smudges, spray with some fixant and apply clear gesso. N not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Um, I considered, in fact, doing that. Now, the plight, you could spray. I actually processed through this, and I thought, yeah, spray acrylic, that's what they say. But when they, they have to put a propellant in the spray, and the propellant mixes with the paint, so you're not getting pure acrylic. Like a spray acrylic, psst, it's not the same as brush-on acrylic. There's chemicals in the spray that made me nervous about coming back and doing oil on top of that. Does that make sense? It might work, but I didn't want to risk it. And then, if, and then I thought, well, I'll just brush on uh, transparent, but the brushing on would also cause it to smear. Maybe not as much, but good thinking. You experiment. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> and you have to come back to me in 50 years. Let me know if it worked, of course, because... Um, Oh, Thinker888, thank you for reminding me. I said I was going to do a video about Bob Ross's brush tricks. I am indeed. No, I haven't done it. You haven't missed it. Uh, yeah, I like my easel. Lope Guerrero. <laughs> Lope Guerrero. 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 Is it Hispanic? I th I'm assuming. Lope. Um, knowing your tomato is fruit is knowledge. Knowing not to put it in your fruit salad is <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> That's great cause. Thank you. Love it. Love it. <laughs> John says, never thought I would hear the phrase, our priority painting video. <laughs> yeah, you'll hear a lot. Of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. John says, my customer is watching this video. Woo. I was hoping not, John. I was hoping not. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that would be bad. I probably should have been a little more circumspect, shouldn't I? Thanks for the warning, my friend. Uh, okay, <laughs> maybe I'll go back and bleep that part out. <laughs> uh, oh, I hope she's not listening. She's not an artist. She doesn't generally watch. But anyway, good point.
patience. I'm very, 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 very sorry for the trouble there. Um, I'm assuming nothing. I am getting monitor now. I had to restart everything. Anyway, okay, so I, was, I won't repeat everything I said, but I was talking about painting by eye, not by rules. You, don't, you never paint by rules. You know the rules and their guidelines, but the final analysis is always you paint with your eyeballs. You don't paint according to the rules. They are not your master. They're only guidelines. You can really get into trouble if you don't understand the difference between rules, laws, and guidelines. You do not paint by laws. You paint with your eyeballs, which is an understanding level in, in the level of cognition. It's deeper than knowledge. Knowledge is simply knowledge. Understanding is understanding how to do the, the, the rules, if you will the laws, the guidelines. All right, so here you see me, and uh, I look forward to getting a chat from somebody to make sure that I'm actually broadcasting. Again, sorry for the technical issues here. Um, so here's my, my photograph that I'm going by. Uh, I did a grid, which I never do. <laughs> I hope you hear the irony in that statement to say I never do something when I just did it means I don't never do it, right? I don't never do it. Double negative on purpose there. All right, and uh, not only did I draw it once, that is to say, draw the drawing, which I am, which I protest usually quite vigorously, right? I, I object, I, I say, no, 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 don't, do not draw at the beginning of a painting. That's That's my standard, advice and counsel and practice, right? Well, now, now, not only am I, not only am I drawing it once, I'm actually drawing it twice because I drew it first in pencil and now I'm drawing it again. So breaking this, even though I'm using brushes and paint, I call this drawing, right? I, I hope, I'm sure you understand that. I'm sure you don't need an explanation there. It's, it's a linear, I'm drawing lines with my brushes, therefore it's drawing, it's not, not painting per se. Um, so once again, every rule can be broken. You just have to know when to break them. Um, now the reason in this case, why am I breaking right now? Because the, the dark lines on, up here are pencil. And if I do a lot of rubbing, I can get away with a little bit, but if I do much rubbing on them at all, um, it will turn into a gray mess. So I am going over the pencil. I don't mean over every single, every single solitary line, you understand. But I'm echoing, I'm reconfirming the drawing, uh, the pencil drawing with paint drawing. So then, um, once these lines dry, they will be impervious and it won't matter so much what happens. I can wipe off, wipe off and wipe out the gray without uh, losing the, these, this acry acrylic marks. Make sense? So the, the, the irony though is, is, is I, I quote unquote, I never draw, quote unquote, you get the irony there. It's obviously that's not technically true because here I am drawing. I never draw at the beginning of a painting. Uh, but here I am, in fact, drawing. In fact, not only once, twice. <laughs> once with uh, pencil and second time with paint. Now, I was saying earlier, whether you heard me or not, I'll repeat it. Why do I say, why do I say don't start a drawing don't start a painting with drawing. Sorry, forgive my stumbling lips. Why do I say don't start a painting by drawing? The main reason is because as soon as you put pencil lines, pencil marks, or in this case, paint lines on the can canvas, it is virtually impossible. And again, I'm going to prove this wrong in a minute too 
but it's virtually impossible. And I was a little bit mean and nasty, and I'm going to repeat it again, especially for you. Um, it's virtually impossible to um, avoid avoid coloring in the lines. So once you put lines on your canvas, like draw e lines, I'm talking about draw ish lines, outline e lines, like what I'm doing right here. Once you put drawing lines on your canvas, it's virtually impossible to avoid then quote unquote coloring in the lines. And coloring in the lines is is where the death is. <laughs> if I if I may be a little over dramatic there. That's what kills the painting. And and again, most of you are like me, and you would say, I'm tight but I'd like to be loose, okay? That's you and me both. Now, I, forgive me for sounding, I don't know what the word, a little bit arrogant, but it's quite simple. It's, I'm, let me, very few people who are way, way, or demonstrably, demonstrably better artists than I don't watch my video, right? Like I, there's a ton of people, for instance, on YouTube that, I don't, I, I don't consider to be very good uh, painters, artists. I'll, I'll, I'll many. <laughs> I'll blow by them, you know, I'll, I'll watch them once or twice, mostly just to find out, to determine if, if they're really good. And, and uh, if I discover or determine or discover that, no, nope, they're not really that good, then I don't watch them anymore. Okay, so. That, that helps explain about what I'm about to say. So I'm better than most of you only because if you're better than me, you're not watching. You get that? Okay. So those of you who are skills are not yet up to my level even, you have even a harder time resisting the temptation to color in the lines. Now I know this is true because I, I hang out with, you know, student beginner wannabe artists all the time in my monthly painters group, when I teach classes, when I judge art shows and so forth. So it's not like I'm, I'm not, I am not unaware of how um, uh, painters paint, <laughs> struggling, struggling artists. I'm not, I'm not unaware of uh, in what arena they struggle. Okay. So, so that I, I have quite a strong concept of I know what you're messing with. I know what you're struggling with. Whoops, this line is wrong. There we go. All right. A um, couple things. This is not very exciting. I don't necessarily expect to make you watch me. The, make you. <laughs> see if I can make you do anything. I don't expect you to make you watch me uh, do much of this here. But I'll point out just a couple things. Uh, one, just for fun, I, I nearly always have a a different color on each brush. Like there's violet on that brush and thalo blue on that brush. Likewise, I virtually always have a different color. No, that's what I just said. I virtually always have a different shape brush in each hand. So this is, a, I would guess, a number 10 and this is a number six, both filberts, but One's larger and one's smaller. And the reason for both of those, of course, as you may expect, is variety. Now I'm dipping into ultraviolet and, and purple or violet again. So I can't wait to get to the part of this process where I'm going to show you um, how I'm going to overcome the temptation to color in the lines. Now, you, those of you who are my regular watchers, this will be no surprise to you whatsoever. Not the least surprise. Um, as soon as these lines that I'm drawing right now are dry, then I'll, at that point I will have a, a firm and solid grip on the drawing of this painting. Does that make sense? It will be 
all downhill from there. <laughs> um, then, at that point, I'm going to go back to my typical, the way I typically start a painting, which is by making great big, huge, completely abstract marks um, that are completely contradictory to this drawing. And even after that, the early, early stages of do, actually doing the painting, I'll be doing large glazes, like with a six inch wide brush or, you know, with, with rags. Um, and, and that is what most of you would not be doing. <laughs> if I left you, as I as usually, if I've left you to your own devices. So um, it is in fact possible. This is important. If you've heard everything else I've said today, this this could be important. It is in fact possible to start a painting with a drawing and not fall into the trap of coloring in the lines. And I, and I hope if you're a student, and if you're not familiar with the way that I paint, I hope you'll stay, stay tuned later today when I come back and, and begin doing color or painting, real painting, if you will, on top of this. Pardon me, I have a problem here. Batteries that are running down when they shouldn't be. Anyway, um, I, I do hope that, that, that if, again, if, especially if you're not a regular, because you're, you can't picture, you can't imagine what I'm going to do. I've just told you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do huge, abstract, completely abstract marks on top of this drawing in opposite colors, and opposite shapes. And I mean that quite seriously. And then and then even after that, as I begin, let's say I want it, this building right here is mostly pale yellow tan. Um, if I if I wanted to paint that building, for instance, and I had a, a brush, a six inch brush full of a tan-ish color, which in this case would be transparent orange and yellow. Some of you are thinking, oh, I get it. He's gonna color outside the lines. And by that, th you're thinking like, like this far outside the lines, perhaps. Right, that, to you, that would be radical if you, if you went that far outside the lines. And I want you to see, no, 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 no. I'm talking about it will extend possibly, not, not in a complete circle, but some of the bits of the color will extend a foot outside, a foot outside those lines. Now I can't do that with every single shape, of course, it would be complete chaos. But in many, many cases, um, as I'm quote unquote, coloring this drawing, which is clearly ostensibly what I have right now is, is, a, is a drawing, but I'm going to color it. And I, I've just said, I'm gonna color outside the lines. It can be done. But uh, if you are not, if you are not familiar with how I paint, now you old timers, you know exactly what I mean. And you're saying, yeah, he really does. You just watch, he really does, okay? But you, if there's anybody watching me for the first time, watch me later. Not right now, because I have work to do. <laughs> the job at hand right now for me is to draw, just plain old fashioned draw. And this is not my favorite at all, my favorite way to start a painting. No, I really like starting with complete mess. That would be, if you will, that would be my rule. My standard operating procedure is I paint, start out by painting a mess. But what happens when rules crash into other rules, you have to decide which one gets priority. And in this case, because it's a six and a half by six and a half by seven and a half foot canvas, um, I know from experience that it's very easy 
to, for the drawing to get off. I mean, it just takes a lot of time. I mean, I would get it eventually, but I, I would, in my opinion, I'd, I'd be wasting a lot of time correcting, 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 correcting. Um, and so I've done a grid here. Another way to, uh, to summarize this, what I'm, what I'm describing is that um, I'm starting out this particular painting with a lot of order, structure, um, stiffness, right? I will spend an extraordinary amount of energy in the following layers to hide, cover up, obscure, destroy this, if you will, this hyper order, okay? And that, that is what most of you would have a hard time doing. Not all, but most of you. So I hope, I hope by watching me, you'll in fact gain courage to say, so that you will say, oh, you know what? Now that I've seen it done, I could do that. That's the correct response. So I'm drawing again. Uh, just using all different colors, different size brushes. I'm going to switch brushes here in a minute, just just for variety, so that the whole uh, drawing even is not going not to be done with uh, the same. I'll do that right now. Let me rinse these out. Let's go to a couple different sizes. There we go. One much smaller filbert and then one flat. Flat brushes are perfectly fine. No comments coming on here. Um, that makes me a little bit nervous. <laughs> like you guys aren't hearing me or nobody's watching. And a very, very, very small handful are watching. I can see that as you can. Um, but I will just continue on here. One of the things that I'm going to do after having drawn these accurate lines, the lines that I, the pencil lines that I did initially were quite accurate because I was using a grid, right? I mean, accurate is a relative statement. You understand that? Um, um, I'm going to be in, intentional about drawing uh, erroneous marks, <laughs> bad drawing marks on top of this good drawing. But they'll be, in a sense, they'll be fake. <laughs> I'll be, I'll I'm gonna draw lines that will pretend that they were done uh, early and then made, and then I corrected them. But in fact, I'm gonna do it the other way around because these lines right here are pretty correct. Um, what I'm getting at is you do not want your entire uh, underdrawing, underpainting, underdrawing, you do not want it to be correct, overly correct, because you will end up with not enough uh, interesting marks, not enough chaos on the canvas when you, when it, when you come to the uh, finishing stages. So I will actually fake it. <laughs> and uh, do, some, do several marks, for instance, like, like this. You see, this is an erroneous wrong mark. Same thing here, I'll, be, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll do something right now. Does that make sense? Hope so. And I'm just using a random combination of uh, colors just for fun. I'm not, I'm not being terribly analytical except that I'm not being realistic, okay? I, I don't want to be accurate, if you will, in these colors. I don't want them to reflect the, the color that should be there. Whew. For any of you newcomers, anybody who's stumbled on me, welcome, good to have you on board. If you like what I do, give me a thumbs up and subscribe, hit the bell. I broadcast an average of five days a week. So this week is, is an exception. I didn't broadcast all day 
until today. That's really crazy. When my wife got away, uh, Monday and Tuesday, we were gone all day. So that, that took care. And then Wednesday and Thursday, I was doing other stuff. Uh, by the way, one of the things I did yesterday is I photographed uh, my last large painting. And if you were one of my regulars and you watched me paint the the intersection in Flagstaff, uh, a good copy of that painting is now posted on my YouTube community page. So you can go and look at that finished painting and get a better better view of it than you could from the uh, video that were, you were watching. <laughs> Let's switch over here to some blue colors just for fun. And one of the things I hope that you're seeing, that you're picking up here, is the, the essence of good painting always. That is not, not the essence of a good painting. No, I'm, ta I'm using the word, ver the, the verb form of the word painting, the act of painting. The essence of doing good painting is making interesting marks. Okay, and that, that rule persists from beginning to end, from the very initial first strokes, in this case, which was pencil that I put on the canvas, all the way to the last one. It's, everything is overruled. In other words, realism is not my chief goal. Okay, pleasant, interesting marks is my primary goal. Uh, in, in light of that, that's why I call my painting style, I got, didn't, in, did not make this up myself, got it from David LaFell, one of the big dogs, one of the famous, famous artists here in America. Um, I call, he calls his stuff and I call my stuff abstract realism. It is clearly realism, clearly. That's, that's the easy part. That's the obvious to the, to the uninitiate. That is the obvious. I'm, I'm clearly doing representational painting. Um, but it should be also clear to the thoughtful observer that realism is not my primary focus. Correct. The interestingness of, can I, can I make up that word again? Interesting, the interesting nature of the marks, the colors, the composition, the, the edges, the texture, all those things are paramount over, over realism. Clearly it's realism, but realism is the secondary concern. The primary concern is, in this case, interesting marks and interesting colors. The composition of this, by the way, the composition of this painting was all worked out on Photoshop yesterday on my computer. Now, I've done this scene a dozen times probably over the years, never this large. Um, but so the, the thoughts of composition, issues, compositional issues. Now, of course, I, as you and I know, my, I expect my painting to be, to be considerably more interesting than this photograph. But as far as placement, you know, Where's the horizon? All that kind of stuff. Um, that was all worked out in Photoshop. So again, a little bit of an unusual approach in this, in the case of this painting. Someone might ask, well, are, does that mean if you're going to start doing big paintings, does that mean that they're all going to, you're going to use a grid or something like that? And the answer is no, 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 no. In fact, if I were doing, you know, an Albert Bierstadt, Hudson River School, you know, 19th century romantic painter. If I were going to do one of his, uh, you know, High Sierra Yosemite paintings or something like that, um, I would not start with a grid or drawing at all. I would start, I'm talking subject matter, not painting like Albert Bierstadt, but subject matter. Um, I, would, I would begin my painting in my traditional way without. Why? Because when you're doing a mountain, and if, if your mountain ends up here, when it, in reality, it's 
here, nobody will tell, the, nobody can say, hey, shouldn't that mountain be about an inch to the left or right or whatever? Are you with me? Or if I'm doing a, a, a forest scene and somebody says, hey, shouldn't that oak, isn't that oak tree? I see your photograph. It looks to me like your oak tree ought to be about, you know, two inches to the left or right. Nobody's going to do that because that's nature. This subject matter, however, <laughs> this skyline of the city, yeah, if I get a building three inches or an inch and a half left or right, in this case, that makes a big difference. Do you see? What about figurative stuff? Oh, so glad you asked. And I have no idea. <laughs> I'd like to find out. How would I do if, the, if I was doing a, a large figurative painting? Would I work it out small and then do a grid? My, I'm thinking probably, no, no. I, would, I think I would do a figurative painting, uh, kind of like the way I talked about the mountain painting. Um, I would probably paint out of my uh, reference file, my, my understanding of the figure. I'd be looking at a photograph of, or at a figure, of course, as well. But to get things right, I would probably, be, I'd probably fall back mostly on... So I don't think I would do a grid. I know, I know some people would, even good people, good artists. But I don't think that's what I would do. I think, I think I would paint uh, without, without this kind of um, cheating, if you will. I always call it cheating, then I always have people protesting, say, it's not cheating. And in fact, all cheating is legal. What is cheating? Like grid, this is cheating. And they, they, they <laughs> all cheating is legal. Most of the great artists through history have done it. Here's the, here's the big but coming. But when you cheat, and I run into this all the time when I teach, when I teach painting, especially like a three-day art class out of town, like I did last week, um, I find students whose drawing skills are tragically low, truly. I mean, it breaks my heart. And they've been taking painting lessons for decades sometimes and they can't draw their way out of a paper sack, so to speak. The reason they can't is because their teachers, their previous teachers have given them permission to cheat all the time. Project, trace, grid, whatever. Now all those strategies, all those tricks are legal. You understand? I hope you're catching what I'm saying. Yeah, you can do that, it's absolutely. The final product is what we're after. But what you need to understand that is if you do quote unquote cheat, your skills are deteriorating. <laughs> okay, and I don't know about you, but the thought of my skills going downhill puts the fear of God in me. <laughs> Terrifies me. It's like, no. And as a as a decades long illustrator, freelance illustrator, I in fact who cheated all the time, that's what illustrators do. Um I, when I discovered that my drawing skills, I don't remember, it wasn't this moment, but like at age 40, my drawing skills were worse than they were at age 20, say for instance. That isn't literally true, but that's what I mean. That just absolutely terrified me. So, especially for the last 20 years, I've been very intentional about using cheating minimal and be, and what's the opposite what's the antidote to to when you because sometimes you have to cheat like this this is a good time to cheat um what is the antidote the antidote is get your button gear and do some hard work of sketching sketchbook drawing 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 that's what cures the shrinky brain <laughs> the shrinky brain of cheating cheating how do you how do you get over it so you're not doomed or damned or you know you're not you're not, it's not the end of the road if you, if you have to cheat. No, no, no. It's just not the end of the road. Why? Because you're going you're gonna to take the, you know, the next day, the next week, the next month or whatever to, to practice um, 
to practice drawing. All right, I beat that horse to death, didn't I? <laughs> Nay, <laughs> says the horse. Uh, <laughs> now this part of the painting down here, most of it, it there's got a lot of green, a lot of bushes down here, except for the road. So I want to make sure I don't do the, the bushes, outline them in a, in a blue color. So, so I've got orange and red on my brushes to do these trees. There's a signpost right there and here's a guardrail. Here's the edge of the road. Here's the other edge of the road. The road has, roads have lots of edges, by the way. I don't know if you know this or not. <laughs> and there's a car. There's another sign. And there's bushes. I know this is not terribly exciting for you guys. Hey, while, I'm, while I finish up, some, somebody will be watching this. Um, so I talked this, this morning about two of the three levels of teaching or learning, or you could even say human attainment. Two of the levels are level number one. The lowest level is knowledge. Knowledge is extremely important. Without knowledge, you have ignorance. Without knowledge, you are ignorant. Ignorant is no shame. We're all ignorant about many things. We, and, and most of us, we, all, we have to be uh, informed about only a very limited number of things in life, right? There's a whole lot of things in life I don't need to know about. But there's some things I do need to know about art things. It's, that's my calling, my career, my business. I need to know about art. In that quest, uh, knowledge is the lowest level. Uh, deep, that's kind of like book learning. You, you've, you've, you've no doubt, you have, you've heard that sort of contempt that all people have, I think, intuitively, for mere book learning, M-E-R-E, -E, for, mere, for mere book learning. We, we, we reserve a particular kind of contempt for that because it means you don't really know anything, you just know the facts, you just know. Knowledge is important, but it's not the highest level. So the next level up is understanding. If knowledge is knowing what to do, understanding could be understood as Thank you. If knowledge is knowing what to do, understanding is knowing how to do it. Okay? And I talked about that quite a bit. I, I usually call it the understanding level, I usually call it painting by eye. You don't paint by rules, you paint by eyeballs. Okay? But where should I go? Then there's skill. Which skill? Sure, let's go there first. What is the difference between uh, understanding and knowledge and skill? Very simple and very important. Understanding and knowledge are in your head. Skill is in your hands, in this case, or in your body. If you're an athlete, what you need is extraordinary degrees of skill. If you're a calligrapher, you need skill. You need knowledge too. But knowledge won't get you anywhere as a calligrapher. What you need is extraordinary skill in your fingers themselves, in your hands themselves. Does that make sense? How do you get skill? You don't get it from a book. Skill has to do with muscles, sinews, bones, tendons, and how they all move. A skilled dancer means they move. A skilled athlete means they move. A skilled calligrapher means they move. And uh, in recent months, I've talked about this no little bit because I've, I've come to realize that I used to really look down. I used to uh, hate it when people referred to my artwork and say, oh, you have such skill in your hands because that is completely wrong. Understand that is wrong. 90% of what I do is because of what's in my brain, not, not what's in my fingers and hands. But having said that, do, do I, in fact, have skill in my hands? And I've had, to, I've had to go, oh, you know what? I do. I haven't thought about it a lot over the decades, but I do now. 
And I realize I need some some larger brushes here, by the way, Going for something. So those long, not longer handles, but longer bristles. Um, I'm almost done drawing. Yahoo. Um, so skill is learned by repetition. So for instance, during the last break, when I was, when I was uh, waiting for this paint to dry, I went in the house and I practiced my trumpet and I practiced my saxophone. What was I doing? By the way, and some of you, of course, if you've never lived with a serious musician, and even when I say that, some of you, unless you lived with serious musicians, you don't even know what I mean by that. Because you might say, yeah, my brother played the guitar and he was really good. Or my dad played the violin or fiddle, whatever. Especially in the, in the folks, there are people in the folk music realm who have extraordinary skill, don't get me wrong, bluegrassy, country stuff. But um, you know, uh, um, how do you know a serious musician? The answer is they practice, they don't play. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> I could go off on that for, for hours, but I won't. But anyway, what was I practicing? I was practicing skill, not knowledge. I was practicing skill, muscle movement, muscle memory on both instruments. Uh, my trumpet is my main instrument. Saxophone, I just know enough to be, you know, practice skilled enough to be dangerous, so to speak. But the trumpet is exercises. In fact, same exercises year after year after year a long, long line of exercises where it's just my fingers, making my fingers go as fast as they possibly can, fast and accurate as I can make them move. That's skill. Um, and then when we come back, we'll talk about the fourth category, which is wisdom. I'm going to let this dry for a few minutes and uh, then the fun will start. Yahoo. Thank you. Let's see. Any comments at all? Hey, there's some good comments. Good, good. Thank you so much, you guys. Let me let me take a look at them. I missed them until now, so let's look. Hot dog. Rick Charlotte says a hot dog. I was wondering about your next view. Thank you, Rick. Good to have you on board. Oh, and then no, that was earlier. And then Benji, Benji Perez says, Dan, I've been using varnishes lately, but as a clear layers and using mixed media on top and repeating this. Some point I'll try more glazing. Love your channel and art. Benji, are you by any chance doing what? Maxfield Parrish. Look up Maxfield Parrish. He was my favorite for many, many, many years. Uh, he used varnish in between. Now, this was back in the 20th, early 20th century, so technology may have changed, uh, but his paintings are not doing well at all. They are peeling and falling off. Tragic, because they're fantastic paintings. Uh, be sure to look at, check him out. Check out Maxfield Parrish. Do some research. Uh, you know, do Google his technique and Google how his paintings are doing, just to make sure that that, I don't know if you're doing varnishes in between layers, uh, but uh, Maxim Pierce did that and his paintings are gorgeous, but they're falling off. So take a look at that just to, for what it's worth. And Benji, my favorite lesson from you, all painting is abstract. <laughs> Good, thanks Benji. Uh, yeah, and Vincent, your name is different. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> yes, totally weird way for me to start. Totally. And I've been talking about why I'm doing it here today. Um, I might come back to that later. Maybe not. Anyway, little break here. Um, little break here while this dries. And then when I come back, I'll be I'm going to revert to my old ways. Now that the drawing is down, essentially, essentially the drawing is done. The buildings are in the right place. I mean, the built roads in the right place and so forth. Now, I, then I can have some fun. Okay, little break though, gonna eat some lunch. Be back in a little while. Thanks for watching. All right, welcome back. That was a long break, wasn't it? Where are you? <laughs> That's the first. I, could, I couldn't find my camera. <laughs> That's pretty funny. All right, so everything here is all dry, of course. It's fine to start doing the fun stuff, which for me means <laughs> big brushes, big brushes, big wet brushes, and lots of medium. And let's start making some some marks and I've 
got a spray bottle around here. So here it is. All right. Come on, Bessie. Come on. Come on. Start. There we go. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I'd rather have a hose, honestly. A garden hose would be perfect right about now. But I didn't. I didn't get that set up. So I need to go ahead and wet down a bunch of the canvas. So this stuff really runs and spreads. Okay, so let you see what I'm working with. I've got a butcher tray. Uh, and of course my usual, for, for, for an easel this size, for a painting this size, um, my normal more water. Come on, give me some good runs. I want some nice runs here. The next thing I'm going to do is pick up um, a couple rags. Really, actually, I've discovered um, they, they move the paint around actually better. This is why I like to paint big, ladies and gentlemen, because you can't do this on a small canvas. And it is, in fact, the beauty of the, the kinesthetic motion that any, all viewers will be able to see you know, that a human being was here. That's all right. That a human being was here and made bold, confident, uh, not confident, um, bold, I guess I'll stick with that word, movements. Now, a couple dripping wet rags. I want to make nice marks. Well, that goes without saying, doesn't it? Because what? Because the essence of good painting is making what? Interesting marks. So I don't have to tell you. Okay, now I'm going to make interesting marks. <laughs> right? <laughs> you newcomers, maybe. No, none of you regulars. What am I doing? Anytime I approach the canvas, anytime I approach the canvas, my number one objective, number one objective, anytime I approach any canvas, number one objective, make interesting marks. Everything else is second to that. Well, there's some nice yellow. Now you can see why I had to, perhaps you can see. That again and again, why I had to um, repeat the drawing um, in acrylics after I'd done it in pencil. If, if, if the acrylics weren't there, I'd be, I'd be erasing wholesale. I'd be eliminating huge swaths of, um, of color. I don't know, of drawing with, with these big, bold strokes. And that would not be a happy moment, right? Picking up some purple right now. There we go. That's a nice mark. There we go. Things are flowing kind of the way I want. This is why I like to paint large. Because you can make marks like that. You can't do that can't do that on a small canvas. And people wonder why I've got paint all over my clothes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Nobody wonders why I have paint all over my clothes. <laughs> my grandchildren, they're so funny. Even the two-year-old knows. He recognizes big as clothes, big as my name. He recognizes big as clothes, even if I'm not wearing them. Because he says, paint. <laughs> Got paint on him. <laughs> oh, I love it. Okay, enough of that. Um, I just realized 
I don't have one of my tools out here for, forgive me for just a second. <clears throat> well, I've run into the house and uh, get my water soluble pastels. Yeah. Okay, be back in just a second. I'll talk to you while I'm going, going in the house hallway, front hallway, uh, my studio. Got it, coming back now. Hallway, garage door, slam, there we go. All right, a new toy, two new toys here. Oil sticks and called water soluble pastel painting sticks. <laughs> I don't know how they're, or if they're any different from regular pastels because right if you have regular pastels and you get them wet what do you have wet pastels and anyway as far as i can tell that's what i've got right here but okay <laughs> made by um made by um charvan it's drawing a blank for a second there Oh, come on, come on, come on. I keep running into the sticks, the boards behind this. Okay, so what am I doing right now? I am just making a glorious abstract painting. Normally, again, for you newcomers, what you see me doing right now is what I normally do at the very beginning of a painting. on a blank canvas. The only difference this time is that uh, my canvas already has a drawing on it. Right? And uh, those pieces are so small I can hardly hang on to them. But that's enough of those colors. That was kind of a an aqua and a spring green. Let's switch over now to a bubblegum pink and a uh, Chinese red is what I would call these. Once again, there's breaking right and left. So every time I hit the, the center board, they break again. What am I creating? I'm creating delightful chaos. All right, enough of those markers, I think, for right now. I'll come back and use more of that later. Um, are we hurt? Are we hearing? You hearing me okay here? Let's make sure we got sound here. Test one, two, three. Test one. Hang on, hang on. Let me check. Okay, we're okay. Um, normally, now, at, after doing the abstract at this on a painting this big, the very next thing I would normally do would be a white abstract. But I am on the verge <laughs> of losing much of my detail here. Now, I don't want that after all the work I did to get the drawing up there. I don't want to obliterate it. That would be disappointing, shall we say. So I am going to do white, but I'm not going to do white abstract. I'm going to go right ahead and do white um, highlights, if you will, in the painting. Now, let me, again, let me show you my, I went, I printed during my, one of my last breaks, um, I printed the photograph and got it laminated because otherwise it's going to get spatted with paint if it's just a print, you know. And I also have here, this is important, I've, I've done, painted this scene maybe a dozen times over the last 15 years, um, maybe 10, I don't know. Um, never this big, of course. And, and so I went into my archives and found my favorite painting, just my favorite. I've done many. Uh, my favorite that I've done, of the dozen I've done, this is one that I like. And I'm, I'm going to be using this, I'm going to be using this for my detail accurate reference, right? But I'm going to be responding to this, um, for overall composition and so on and so forth. Color. I actually did this live 
um, at a at a fundraiser last year in about two and a half hours, I think. Sold for $4,500, I believe. 30 by 40, something like that. Maybe not that big. Anyway, so that was, that was a good that was a good fundraiser. And I painted it really fast and it turned out really well. As I said, that's my my favorite one at the moment. Okay, so I have here a photograph for uh, accuracy and for accuracy of reference. But I also have a, a painting for a reference for um, you know decisions, art decisions, compositional decisions. So I'm not. So in a sense, that these these two things are. I didn't do a thumbnail. I didn't do a. I didn't do a no tan. I didn't do a thumbnail. I didn't do a. I didn't as I would often do in this new era of huge paintings. I would typically do a study, you know, a moderate sized study. Uh, but but not in this case, why? Because I've already painted this scene, as I said, a dozen times. So this is my study. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm looking at both of these for reference. Now, if there's any way, I, I can't, but if there's any way I could keep um, this whole, everything on this canvas wet while I do the white, I, I would do that, but I can't. So it, it's going to, pretty soon I'll be painting uh, wet on dry, which is how most most of you want to paint, right? Uh, because it's, it's the control freak's friend. <laughs> Painting on a dry painting is what control freaks like to do because it's easier to control. <laughs> Duh. Um, but I wish, in fact, that I could keep it wet the whole time so that I get more play, more interplay between this white and the colors that I just put down, that, all that abstract stuff. But can't. I know I could spray it with water, still wouldn't have quite the same... Oh, partly because already much of it is dry. So I'm kind of stuck in that regard. Now, repeat after me. Class, students, repeat after me. Every time I approach my canvas, my number one concern is what? What is it? My number one concern. Every single time I approach a canvas, no matter what phase, stage I'm in, Yes, to make interesting marks. So what am I most concerned with right now? Duh. Interesting marks. Exactly. Thank you. Similitude, that is to say realism, takes a back seat. It is, you know, realism is important to me. It is important, but it's second important. I know I keep, I know I keep harping on that. <laughs> harp, harp, harp. Because one of these days, we all going to get it. We all going to get it. Hey, while I'm on the subject, so again, just to, uh, for, for any newcomers or for you old timers, same old principles and new words. <sighs> Most people, 99.999%, or maybe two nine, it's not three. <laughs> for most people, their art journey goes something like this. They spend the first half of their journey learning how to paint stuff that looks like stuff. And that's a very important part of the journey. And then they spend the second half of their journey learning how to paint. Ooh. First half, paint stuff that looks like stuff. Second half, paint, period. I just got paint on my bicycle light. <laughs> if it 
I've got, a, I've got my bicycles hanging up here behind me. Oh boy. Um, first half of journey, paint stuff that looks like stuff. Second half of journey, create paintings that look like paintings. Now, there are many, many, many people, some of whom are very good and famous and successful and rich, who never enter the second half. They're the exception, but there are some. I could go into a long, good explanation as to why that is so, and it's okay that it's so. It's okay. We're not all on the same journey, but I am telling you that most of us our journey, we, we have this in common. First half of our journey, learning, I could, let me say it in other, different words this time, learning how to draw. First half, learn how to draw. Second half, learn, learn that, that the canvas is not a magic window through which we view an alternate reality. That is, that is old-fashioned painting. That is before the invention of the camera. That, in fact, was the job of the artist, was to render a realistic scene that the viewer would feel like they could, especially if it's this big, they could step right through it into the world that is portrayed on the canvas. And, and again, one summary description of that is realism. 150 or more years ago, um, whoa, great big change happened. Some rascal, Doggero over in France or something, somebody, some rascal invented a camera, completely usurped and overturned the artist's role in history. That's not the only thing that happened, but that is one of the big things that happened. So suddenly the artist's job, well, I guess it wasn't suddenly. We had, it took, a, it was quite, quite the, upheaval and as all upheavals in society it took a while to filter down um, it took the first well actually I don't know I guess if you say 1840 was the invention of the camera and Malkovich's black on black black square painting was 1913 so that's 53 63 years so it took 50 or 60 years for that reality to sink in. Now, Picasso, for instance, never ever did make the switch to pure abstraction. He always did, his whole life, he did pictures, painted pictures, as opposed to, say, Piet Mondrian, who in the eyes of many, in the opinion of many, and I'm tempted to share their opinion, I get close to it, that he, he took abstract painting to its logical, scientific, mathematical conclusion. Piet Mondrian is one of th three primary colors, red, yellow, blue, squares, and so on, arranged, and oh, and black, uh, arranged on the canvas. And, 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 and uh, now I contend, see, I, some people think that Pete, Pete, <laughs> his American name, Pete, Piet Mondrian, Dutch, would say that he, he, had, he was part of the crowd that eschewed beauty, that he was against beauty. Um, but I, th I think that's a misunderstanding of Mondrian. He, he, I think he was very much involved with beauty. He just, he just reduced it to its absolute. It was not a, he was not an anti-beauty-er. <laughs> Part of the reason I believe that is that he was not preaching anything. He, he wasn't political. Most of the people who abandon beauty abandon it to go in art, in the art world. They abandon it to go into political propaganda. And Piet Mondrian, as far as I can tell, never lifted a finger, so to speak, to, to, to get into um, propaganda. Which is, by the way, again, most most college art departments, almost all college art departments in the West, in Western civilization these days, they are training their students to be political propagandists. They're not training them to paint. They're painting them to pontificate. 
Anyway, I've, I've done that enough times. I'm not going to go over that again. If you're thinking of majoring in art in the university, though, um, don't do it. <laughs> Only if you want to go into art education and mess with the heads of elementary, middle, and high school kids, then you can major in art. But if you want to be an artist, oh my goodness, by all means, do not major in art in college. They are not teaching you how to make art. Anyway, I digress somewhat, don't I? Um, okay, this would be a good time. That's a good segue. This morning, and then earlier this afternoon, I've been talking about the four spheres of human uh, learning, cognition, maybe I could call it, four levels of thinking. They're somewhat hierarchical, but not strictly. Okay, here, here they are. When I, if, if, you, if you missed it this morning, let me give it to you. I, learned, I, I first was exposed to this in my master's degree, which was not in art, thank God. <laughs> then my bachelor's degree messed me up bad enough took me decades to recover from my bad master art bachelor's art degree um, there are four levels I'm going to say four levels of cognition four levels of teaching four levels of learning this is something that pedagogy uh, teachers people who study teach the subject of learning uh, would be familiar with. Okay, four levels are knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and skill. And let me give those to you again. They are four levels of teaching, four levels of learning. They are knowledge, understanding, wisdom, and skill. Now, knowledge is one, is knowing stuff. Understanding is deeper than that. It's knowing how to do the knowledge. Wisdom is deeper than that. That's knowing why to do, the how to do, the what to do. Knowledge is what to do. Understanding is how to do. And being overly simplistic, and, knowledge, and wisdom is why to do. So this morning, I've already spent quite a bit of time talking about the, the first two, knowledge and understanding. And I've been goading you, <laughs> students, art students, you have to move beyond knowledge. You have to start with knowledge. Ignorance is not, no shame in being ignorant, but there's shame in staying ignorant, okay? But you, you don't suffer from that. People in the West don't, that's not what they, they don't want to stay ignorant. People, people in the West, they want to get informed. Um, our problems lie elsewhere, so to speak. I need some bigger brushes to do this down here, so I'll come back to that later. Um, if, if, if I have three fingers, I actually have four, but let's pretend I have three. They are knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And skill works in juxtaposition to those three. These three go in order from shallow to deep. From shallow, not, I guess I should go this way, Sh shallow, no, okay, shallow. Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Skill is separate from those. And skill can be taught, skill can be learned, but it's, on, it's only achieved through practice, through repetition. Skill is, is not, strictly speaking, I mean, you, you can speak of somebody having like mathematical skill or something, but that's loosely speaking. That's not really what skill is. Skill involves the literal movement of the body. Athletes and dancers and, um, Musicians, those are three areas in our culture that focus exquisitely on skill. Uh, in the art world, I, I am, in fact, yes, exhibiting skill when I paint, um, in spite of my protests, because a lot of people think that art is a skill, and it is not. It's 99% between the ears, or 90% between the ears. 10% what's at the end of your arms, your hands. It's, it's mostly, my art skill is using the term loosely the way, the way uh, people use it when they're not speaking strictly. 
um, my art skill is mostly between my ears. But strictly speaking, skill has nothing to do with mind, has to do with body. It's moving. And so um, in the art realm, the, the, the kind of art that is extremely, like dancing, like musicians, like athletes, is, is all about skill, is calligraphy. Calligraphers are skill, 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 movement of the body. Go to go online and watch some. Go to video. Go to YouTube, and uh, just just do Google some calligraphy, and you can see some freakish. I mean, people that are just accomplishing things almost beyond belief. They're so good. That's skill. Okay. Now, the one area we haven't talked about, and here we go. <laughs> the question always is, how deep do I want to get into this stuff? So. You know, I'm going to try to pull up before I go so deep I lose everybody. Knowledge is knowing what to do. Understanding is knowing how to do it. It's sim overly simplified, but I'll let go of that. Wisdom is knowing why to do it. Why are you an artist? What are you trying to accomplish with your art? And, um... I'm actually thinking seriously. I've been asked to do another presentation here in the Triangle area. Um, carry visual arts in a couple weeks. And uh, I think I'm going to do a lecture, if you will, a presentation on the quest for beauty. So I'm, let, me, let, me, let me use you guys as a trial balloon. Um, again, I, you know, I don't know how many people, how many artists even care. I've, I've, I've talked, I've spoken to my fellow visual artists uh, several times over the years um, about subjects like this. For instance, I would say to them, how, how do you explain, you, my, my fellow artists, people like me who are trying to do ostensibly, evidently, apparently beautiful paintings, and yet when you go into the, like in my case, the North Carolina Art Museum, um, everything you see there uh, in, the, in the contemporary section, in the modern section, is decidedly not beauty. In fact, I would say, if you get the impression that they're against beauty, then your impression is correct. They are actually at war with beauty. I don't know if you know that or not. A lot of people don't. Anyway, a lot of my fellow fellow painters just don't care at all to enter that fray. Um, and they just say, whatever, to each his own. And, I, and that's all right. There, there's some people, that's their calling, gifting, purpose in life. They're not called, as I think I am, and I might be kidding myself, to answer such difficult questions. So I, in fact, am compelled to try to answer the question, what is going on here? Why, when I walk into the contemporary, which is the major part of, of our North Carolina Museum, as it is wherever you are, it's probably the same, same where you are, you walk around with your nose kind of scrunched up and shrugging and go, I don't get it. And then if you read all the verbiage, <laughs> the, the little things that are next to it on the wall, you know, there's more words here than there is paint on the painting sometimes. And you, you still scratch your head and say, what? That was crazy. I don't get it. Um, some people just don't even care to, to enter into that discussion. Uh, I am one of those who does care to enter into the discussion and try to come up with understanding. So, um, and it's related to the subject of wisdom. Why do I do what I do? Okay, so, I do what I do. I, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with the right words here. This is a speech that is not yet written. This is a presentation that I have not yet made, okay? But it, it's, it's pretty obvious, I would expect, to the most casual observer, it's pretty obvious that Dan Nelson, by looking at his artwork, the, at the body of his work, it's pretty obvious, I would think, that he's fairly intent on achieving 
what he perceives to be beauty. All right, fair enough. Now, again, for those of you who did not get an art degree or don't follow such things, maybe you don't know this, but if it is it obvious to the casual observer, I think it is, that I, that Dan Nelson, is pursuing something we might call beauty. I think it is pretty obvious. You, if you don't know this, you should know this. That virtually, and I'm not, I, don't, I, don't, I think I'm being fair here, virtually every professor in virtually every art department in every university in the Western world. So I'm, I'm accepting here some colleges and certainly many art schools but universities, like in our town, you know, University, the, the Humanities College, the one that actually has an art major. By, uh, uh, um, they look at my stuff and see, perceive that I believe in beauty and that I'm pursuing it and I'm trying to create it. You need to understand that they don't, they don't again, they not only don't like what I'm doing, well, they're repulsed by what I do. They are not pretending. They're not pretending to be offended or... Now, if I even get that far, for most of them, they would just consider me to be uh, philosophically benighted in the dark. I'm just an idiot. Uh, and again, I, I'm not... This is not like I'm not feeling sorry for myself. Quite the contrary, I feel sorry for them. But, and, and some of you don't even know that. You're, you're, you're kidding, right? No, 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 I'm not kidding. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, the likelihood, like, in fact, a couple years ago, just for kicks and giggles, I applied to, to, to an adjunct art professorship at a community college um, two miles from my home. And of course I didn't get accepted um, because they would look at my stuff and say, oh, oh, <laughs> gag throw up, stick ice picks in my eyeballs. I can't stand this stuff. I know, isn't that funny? So how'd we get to that point? <laughs> okay, so th that's just in a, sort of an aside. And, and again, that's for some of you people. I, I'm always amazed when I find people that don't know that that's the case. Like, you know, I sat across, I sat around in a living room they, uh, a couple years ago where they, you know, invited me to speak and I spoke on sort of the realities of the art community, the art world. And most of them were clueless and completely aghast. They had no idea. They, they have no idea what goes on, say, in the art department at the universities of America. No idea. And, and they were completely shocked and bordered on not believing me. <laughs> Which is fine. <laughs> it shows how completely <laughs> Ostrich and saying they are. Um, hang on here a second. I need to think about what I'm doing. <laughs> that would be a good idea, don't you think? Okay, I'm, I'm done with these little brushes. I, I still have a lot of white to do, but I need to do it with some bigger brushes. So hang on, just I need to rinse these out. Um, now, there are exceptions to what I'm saying, but they are few and far between. And uh, every time I go on this tirade online on my video here, on my, broad, on my uh, channel here, I always get art majors, I always get art majors commenting and say, yep, yep, That's exactly what I experienced. My college art experience was completely typical of 20th century uh, art education. They did not teach me how to paint. They tried to teach me how to survive in what, in the realities of the art world. Um, all right, enough of that, bigger brushes. Let me go now to, so what, what am I doing? Wisdom, why do I paint the way I paint, okay? And uh, we'll see, we'll see how far I should get into this. I'm not sure how, how deep I should go, but I'll go till I feel like it's too late. <laughs> until it's too late to get to back out. <laughs> um, okay, I need to be looking at my images quite seriously here Bye, hey sweet girl bye bye bye, bye. bye.
<laughs> uh, the kids are going off somewhere. Um, why do I paint beautiful? Okay, because, and, and it's pretty obvious, I would think, from the, before I even say a word, if I believe in beauty, then in a way, one label you'd have to put on it, that, that in some sense, I believe in the metaphysical. That is to say, I believe there's something beyond the mere physical. And indeed, I do. Now, some of you are going to get real nervous because, first of all, you, you assume painting. See, that's, I might be. I usually don't get, go down this road too far. People thinking, oh, he's getting religious. Have, and I could, I could. No need to convert anybody, okay? The issues. Talk about beauty. Um, Or even a deist. You don't have. You can be a secular evolutionist. You can be a secular evolutionist, atheistic evolutionist. Um, so I'll put, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go this way. I'll start. I'll start here. I'll say. Evolutionary, so to speak, human beings, they will not evolve to their next level of consciousness. So I believe that human beings self self awareness that that creature is then responsible for its own <laughs> and I know even by that I'm driving some it's in force. By process, the creature that is evolved is no longer blind or chance, which is the right, the prerogative, the responsibility that um, critical to that. That is, we here, filled evolutionists to a grumpy, which are the typical ones. They say. That's what I'm looking for. An accident, of course, but um, are just vestiges left over from our. The only reason we feel some things are beauty is that gave us a leg up. In <laughs> Somebody says, "What is it? What is it? All organisms want to do." lay around <laughs> I'm not, I'm sorry, it's really funny and that's not it but you know procreate <laughs> the evolution to say that the the feelings that you is perceived by you to be beautiful is because that helped our forebears find and we're alarmed and so on do you see what i mean so, but those kind of grumpy evolution, and now we can just look back and see how we did. And I say, no, 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 we're not done yet. We're still in the real, and that we perceive it. And it, it, from now on, our evolutionary for a second. Um, now, for some of you who are perhaps recognize that I'm sort of speaking in code, because uh, Nazareth, but have no trouble affirming everything I just said often. But but I am not at war with them. Um, is real can be defended from an evolutionary point of view. And that there I could talk 
about that's this half baked, but uh, the quest for beauty. Um, philosophy of beauty is is beauty objectively out there real or is it I've been at some points convinced yeah it's just really all subjective after all you know do worms perceive something um I don't believe that anymore and now I now I'm I, although I respect it I can objective reality whoo that would get me kicked out of the philosophy department and the art department both in one sentence I And that's okay. I understand. By the way, for what it's worth, I'm not a painter who philosophizes. My core identity is thinker, not painter. Just I'm an amateur philosopher because I'm really a professional painter. It's quite the other way around. Um, again, I'm speaking. Not art. Philosophy and history. Think about it. History and philosophy. And I have such a degree because of the way that I think. So just again, for what it's worth, I might be completely the the academy, I know what the 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 university To their objection. <laughs> of course I do. Just like they have one to mine. All right. <laughs> Weeks in carry about the quest for beauty. And it'll it'll come down to a very practical, the kind of stuff you it doesn't mean sunshine or daisies or ah thank you, you're yeller. No, no, no. It's what do they represent? They don't they represent motion. All right. A bit. I don't know if you guys, I'm assuming you can hear the music. Okay, right says I got to check my voicemail. I'll do that, right? Ah, well, good, Vincent, a.k.a. David. But Dan, if you won a large amount, like if I won a bunch of money, where would you go to find that one art? I hate to be predictable, but uh, I mean, I think if I, um, but without thinking too deeply, it would be Rembrandt. And European, uh, at the same time that Florence and Italy was blowing up, Halls, um, the Dutch still lifes, um, um, you know. I would also take a I'd take a gander at some um, 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 go. Um, great question. A lot of fun. Thanks. Uh, wrong stream. I am trying to see right now if we have good connectivity. But I'll I'll start painting anyway. So that all the white stuff I did is rainy outside, so my my acrylics are drying extremely slowly. Well, let me show you what I'm working on anyway. Um, in this is a painting, exactly the same angle, but pretty close. And so I'm painting quite. And uh, this is one of those paintings where I'm going to underpainting. So that means 
Um, hard to talk sometimes in pain. Under my blue sky. Now this, for the last year, complimentary underpainting, you know, pink or yellow or something underneath a blue sky. Policy, more regular, that any time that I have do a pink underpainting. Basically, uh, more or less a Cape Cod or a modified or cheap Cape Cod underpainting. Whoa. Because basically all it means is have orange under the sky. Boy, that easel has got a lot of rock in it. Easel has come loose. That's not a good thing. Um, I'm going, did not do a study for this particular painting. It's already in the last 15 years. So I just went into my five. Study, if you will. So right at the moment, it's helping. So I'm looking at this to decide um, all right, I think it looks to me, yeah, building tall building in the middle, right and one in the middle. Um, all that is about to change. Now we have a number of buildings. Evidently some white acrylic that is still, after all this, after that hour long wait, not like, so by my wet paint picks up the wet white. Okay, well, uh, I might not be able to get as much done here as I had thought. Minimum, perhaps I can get away with it, but uh, copy, imitate my approach to painting. Do not do that. Don't even mess with it. I feel like I could, I that just picked up some wet and dragged it down. That's because I'm very familiar with what I want it to look like. If you're not familiar, it's not dry, would, would, would completely torpedo your, your painting. The white, the white absolutely has up there. And I know what I'm aiming for. Does that Again, looking at the, looking at the, and according to my observations area, all of this should be right, okay? So anytime that you're painting on top of the pencil lines, they do smear. So usually you Right, you don't go back and forth, no backy forthy, no brushy brushy. So that's what I'm trying to do mostly right now is desperately dangerous is what I had going on all of these here hang on a second let me show you my sorry about that <laughs> you got dropped okay so, so these are all all filled they're not filled but these all have medium about 60 40 60 parts medium 40 parts paint as 90 parts paint
medium. Did I say that right? More medium than paint. Uh, beginners often have a hard time with that. Friends who you know. Um, most beginners the mediums that you add to your paint, like in the olden days, it was linseed oil, that you just put a tiny bit, like linseed oil, world, in my kind of painting, my world of painting, considerable confusion among my students and people trying. It's the opposite. It's a whole bunch of medium and very little paint. Painters intuitively sense should be that that in your stew the medium is like salt and pepper <laughs> sorry comes with the territory <laughs> um that i have to do it in a mocking manner drift um way 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 more medium one of the biggest mistakes that beginners glaze. And uh, not like a brown beer bottle. That is not a glaze. Brown beer bottle, that is a glaze. <laughs> I've never used that analogy before, ever. Okay, so lots of medium, very little paint. Contrary, contrary assume that it's large amounts of paint, little bit of medium. Okay. <laughs> Everywhere you look, <laughs> horse corpses, horse corpses. Everywhere you look, <laughs> that's what I didn't kill. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> the the benefit, the advantage of having a strong seen about ten or twelve times over the last fifteen years, and uh, so I'm using too dark. Okay, so that right there shows me that that particular pot. That pot of paint, ultramarine, add a lot of medium. Ugh, I'm not liking that very much because that's picking up. Happens. You keep working with it, not over, not not killing. Goal is interesting marks always. Medium. Way too intense. Does that make sense? What I just, what you just saw me, when I, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. That's way too dark. So that kind of thing happens. And again, it's like, you know, then paint. That, that's what I'm doing right now. Exactly. Practice. Even this is too dark. That is. There. That is not a glaze. That is a coat of paint. Okay. <laughs> I've never used it now. That's like a brown beer bottle. Brown. But the brown of a beer bottle is way too dark. Um. be the the bluish green of a are you with me um that is one of the most common after i've said to them sometimes i say it's 10 to 1 10 um it's it's because it's one thing that that students that's one of the things they miss most often is that ratio they don't now it's glazy because I wiped it, wiped much of it off. But the stuff I was. Then, I, then again, on the other hand, I've had students who, and I keep my poker face on, say. And, and, and some, they, they, they have it so watered down, like they, there's barely too pale. Right? But, but I always commend those students in the opposite direction. So congratulations to you. Some people who just seem to never, never be able to get. Uh, 
Uh, so th those who get it too pale are actually at an advantage. Don't get it. We're here, so I, I better stop real soon. <laughs> I believe I'm going to call it a day. on this canvas and it's going to take a couple hours to dry uh, probably draw with pencils and and by the way when i am drawing substitute the pencils for conti crayons everything about a big painting is bigger including the lines so of course then in the midst of all my drawing always nothing to do with the picture that I'm painting, right? Those are in the final painting process, I'm assuming, which isn't very much, by the way. If you've done the underpaintings right, there's not much I try to leave myself with as little work to do in the final edit as possible. I try to get it right the first time, and that's certainly what I try to do paint on thickly in the final edits but I'm way I'm layers and layers and layers well I shouldn't say hours and hours just one hours will do <laughs> other things here in a little while but I'm happy with it that's a glorious chaotic off my stream Um, uh, uh, I will tell you, um, except in my garage and I have Jerry rigged the hell out of my tech an hour. Uh, so anyway, thank you for your, in your warning, but from here in the garage, um,